Hello everyone to another insightful podcast and our today's guest is Mr. Khushu Doctor the founder of two startups Sasha Infotech and Metis Intelli Systems welcome Khushu sir thank you so first of all i would like to uh, know the first question is how did you started like thought that i would start a startup and leave my job <laughs> say if you are in ahmedabad hmm. the entrepreneur skills is in the air hmm. okay if you look at it at some point of time or other everyone in ahmedabad wants to have a startup have a have a business not a startup have a business it's it's the typical gujarati gujarati business blood <laughs> yeah and though people might say i am not a gujarati i am a parsi hmm. but the whole thing goes into your blood so hmm. what wherever whatever you are doing it goes on and you it gets infectious and you really want to start your own business and i was too independent minded to work at a place for long i wanted to do things differently things my way and that is that is how i ended up being an entrepreneur so you were sir like your first company was tasha infotech right oh. no no okay. no my first company was not tasha infotech uh, tasha infotech was incidentally my third company okay so what so i had that? one company called creatica con communications first long time back in the 90s then i had i was the director technical of signal infotech uh, and then i started tasha tasha so i would like to know that like you were in the technology thing from start only or was like you you had some other interest regarding other than that no i i have never done anything in my life except technology i i have done everything everything whatever i have done is centered around technology that box of technology always remains there So, like, where did you like started your education, and when did yeah. you got this? So, work? my education has a very interesting story. Hmm. I never wanted to become a technologist. Okay, I was all set on becoming a chemist. Hmm. I was very good in chemistry in my college days. Hmm. I I did my B.Sc. Chemistry, uh, and was set on joining M.Sc. Chemistry and all that. But my father. Hmm. Uh, came and told me that you no no you should not do chemistry you should you should do technology hmm. now there are there are you must have heard of cases where parents talk the opposite your my father was t- talking the opposite hmm. okay i wanted to become somebody he said no no you go and do because your characteristics the way you behave you are more suited for some something that is n- different from chemistry and hmm. then he came and introduced me and he said okay go and give a entrance exam to a diploma course there was a diploma course at bharatiya vidya bhavan at that day which is which was very close to my house in those days so he said go and give the entrance test and i still remember that entrance test was one day before my paper 10 of chemistry bsc chemistry ka paper 10 tha us se one day all right and i said no way i am not going because bsc because that paper 10 is a very complex he said take your half an hour or an hour break and go and give that entrance test that is how my entrance into uh, it started and i gave the entrance test i cleared it i did my diploma diploma in uh, computer management edp and computer management that was the name of the course by bharatiya vidya bhavan they were the early movers at that point of time and that's when i did it may must be in 90s or 92 Hmm. if i am not mistaken in 1992 that is when i did my diploma got done very well and then did my masters in computer application from the first batch of rolwala computer center that is gujarat university that's how i entered uh, okay. technology okay so for, after that you like did a job in like which company something yeah like? i i uh, joined united phosphorus private limited as as a Ma- deputy manager systems mm-hmm. and i set up i was responsible for a lot of uh, innovation there setting up systems there and all that and then i did my i started my first company okay and from there things happened yeah so i also read in your profile that you uh, train or i would rather say teach like what how which students or which people do you train or teach i i am a visiting faculty at a few colleges okay I, 
for eight nine years i was a visiting faculty at dhirubhai ambani institute of information and Com uh, computer technology at gandhinagar and after that now i teach at ahmedabad university okay. and the teaching is more in terms of giving back to the students giving back to people who really uh, needs to know uh, about from an experienced person. So I love to share my experience. So I, I select topics and uh, subjects which are relevant to my experience. So software engineering principles I teach or I teach project management. I was a certified information systems auditor. So I teach computer security. So I teach these subjects where I had have had a hands-on experience and my experience can benefit others. Okay. I, uh, I take uh, I take a whole course. I I teach a whole course, okay. uh, even greeting like, students, working with them to hmm. understand how things are done in real life. Okay. So the, the duration of the course is generally? 13 weeks. 13 weeks. So, sir, one more thing. I just, uh, I was like going through your profile. I just saw that you participated in G20 as well. Yeah, we were, we are a part of, we were a part of IHUB and uh, IHUB uh, was our incubator. So there was a beautiful, beautiful function happening in Gandhinagar. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Gandhinagar, we have a very beautiful convention center called the Mahatma Gandhi uh, Convention Center, which is a very one of the uh, might comparable to the best in the world. And that is where the, uh, the G20 Governor's Council of all the banks, top banks, was happening in uh, Gandhinagar. And that's where we were allowed to go there, put up our stalls, talk with people, so on and so forth. So how was that experience? <laughs> Amazing. It's when you talk with uh, the best in the business, mm. you get, there is a lot of learning. Whether you do sales or not is something very different, but there is always learning. And when, when there is learning, you progress. So I also saw that you have received some awards uh, with like the, as a startup, you have received some awards. Uh, like how did you got there and what was the experience? With not it? as a startup, but yes, we did uh, participate in the top tech uh, visionary awards that was held in Dubai. And that's where... They were, they evaluated the profile and then that's how things happen. How did Tasha Infotech start it and what does Tasha Infotech do? So I was 10 years with a large MNC, mm -hmm. not MNC, a large Indian IT services company. I did a lot of work for them. Uh, I even went to Australia to handle business development. So, so I played a multifaceted role with that organization. And I was very happy with them. They have given me, that organization gave me everything that I desired and I needed. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it was an organization. So there were, there were boundaries. Yeah. And that is where after 10 years, after my responsibilities, family responsibilities got over, I, I thought of giving myself a second chance or a third chance at entrepreneurship. Okay. And then, uh, I left, I started, <clears throat> I started this organization, a services organization called Tasha Tech Info Solutions, Private Limited. So what does Tasha InfoTech basically do? It's an IT, it's a bespoke IT services company. We do software development based on the needs of the customers and we mm -hmm. work on niche technologies. That's what the work we do. We do software development, we do testing, software testing, we do mobile development, everything. Okay, so like... Uh, would you like to give an idea to me, like what kind of softwares do you build for companies? Like, yeah, we have we do enterprise class solutions, so we do not do small solution unless they are a niche solution. So, for example, we were a third party developer for a large system for MORD, Ministry of Rural Development. We did mm -hmm. a very large enterprise class solution for MORD. So that was one big solution that we built it, it had web component it had mobile component it had everything and we released it we developed it end to end and then we handed it over to nic nic odisha is to whom we handed it over we do bespoke development for startups in australia we do bespoke development for startups in uh, in belgium in europe we do some work in usa we do a lot of niche work in india also 
but that is where the client really wants us to do niche work in an enterprise class solution so our expertise remains on enterprise class solutions we do not do a uh, small work on digital marketing or all that because that is not our expertise we do not understand that as well as we understand the enterprise class solution development okay sir so while starting what were the biggest challenges you faced during the early stage and how did you overcome them very interesting question yeah the biggest challenge is and that is a lesson for all startups yeah do not take external funding as step 1 okay do not do that because then your passion your thought process your ideas are destroyed okay you will always be answerable to the person who has invested money mm-hmm. so this time when i came in i had saved quite a extensive amount of money for this idea of mine mm-hmm. i came with 15 lakhs around close to 15 lakhs i had saved i had put it put that as my benchmark say that if after i spend this money if i have not done sufficiently well then i'll go go, go back to the job hmm. so that's the first thing okay. and the second very important thing is build your network yeah two things are like preliminarily important they are the like your two eyes as your body you have two eyes and you need both the eyes to see you mm-hmm. need money and you need network to succeed as an entrepreneur however good your idea is however good however expert you are in technology if you do not have these two things your chances of success reduce drastically i will not say fail because i have seen some people do well there also but that's that's very few and far between so the biggest challenge we face or any entrepreneur face is getting money and is building network two things so uh, like how do you stay ahead of technological trends in a such a rapidly evolving industry oh, oh it's scary you, you literally let me say it's it's literally if you don't if you do not keep track of the technology trends mm-hmm. on a day to day basis you will get out of this market very very easily so the best thing is get on the network read subscribe to good magazine subscribe to good uh, email blasts talk with reasonably good people participate in good uh, associations all of those things there is nothing one thing that you can do from where you will get information there are a lot of things you can do many a times just a search on the net will give you an amazing result sometimes talking with people will give you good results so keep yourself abreast with everything going on in the market i remember when i stepped out to start my business mm-hmm. and i people started talking about technology i was shocked i was so out of date i was so out of date so after that i have made it a point that i'm going to really really always be abreast of the trends that are happening and still still it is impossible in this world today the way the the technology is moving it's impossible to keep track of everything everything yeah because it keeps on changing like in a minute it's this yeah it's you exactly that. said the right thing in a minute <laughs> things change yeah so the, my next question was this only like it has been a long time since you started tasha infotech what uh, changes you have seen like in the industry since then and till now in 2024 see i cannot say about tasha tech but i'll talk about my life okay yeah. when i started when i started off in 1992 and when i did my first projects mm-hmm. you the computers that we used to use you would not even think that such computers existed mm-hmm. as i never thought such computers that i am getting today i would ever get this mm-hmm. so if somebody had told me about the mobile phone the mobile phone i would have said one thing that it is only possible in that star trek movie nowhere else so we were we, we used to have 8 kilobytes of ram in the first computer that i ro- used i am not talking about gigabytes i am not talking about megabytes mm. i am talking about kilobytes mm. okay yeah. some things that 
people today do not, do not even understand. And that is why people like us appreciate technology more because we have been through every through everything. Mm -hmm. For me, when I started my first uh, business yeah. and I bought a computer, 10 MB of RAM, I had to literally wait in a queue for how many days to just procure that one chip of 10, 10 megabytes. So yeah, amazing changes in this technology. And like, as they say, I have seen this going through a huge paradigm shift from mm. the time I started off till the time what it is today. Today, if you ask me, the biggest shift is in the coding standards, in the programming methodology, which we call the MVC architecture. The MVC architecture has really revolutionized the way coding happens and the way software systems are being built. Okay, so you deal with clients, right? So how does customer feedback play a role in your product development process? Very important. But you have to learn to read between the lines. Yeah. Learn to read between the lines. Very important. Mm -hmm. If you cannot read between the lines, then you are gone. I'll tell you an example. I was handling a very big project with my previous company, a relationship that was going very well. And, and this kind of uh, feedback sessions we used to conduct quite regularly. And there was one feedback, one project, excellent, everything excellent. But the project manager said, but still I'm not happy. Hmm. And that when a project manager at the client side says, I'm not happy, you have to ask him the next question, why? So he said, every, the whole system is going well. But you have never asked me one question. That is, who is going to use the system? Hmm. And my system is going to be used by lawyers all about, by British lawyers, British white lawyers, all about the age of 50. Hmm. And for them, mouse is not a thing that they will use. Mm -hmm. So we had we had never asked the question and we had never developed the system to work without a mouse. Mm -hmm. So these are things, these are things that are so important that even when the client says all good, you have to ask, but what is not good? What can become better? How how do you how do you give that ultimate satisfaction to your client? At the end of the day, he's he's paying, so he needs to be uh ha happy under all circumstances so everybody shares like a story of a perfect uh like product which we delivered or the company which we are dealt with so can you share an example of a failed project and what you learned from it any failed project if, if somebody is saying that there is a perfect product there is no yeah. perfect yeah there is no perfect product on this earth perfect products are only found in mythological books it's a myth. Yeah. So it's a myth. It cannot exist. But there are there are a lot of projects that have gone right, and there are a lot of few projects that have not gone right. Yeah. But every product, every project gives a learning. Yeah. Whether it is a successful project or a failed project. And if you do not invest in learning, mm. then you are a failed human being. Okay. Yeah. Because because the ego, if you have an ego that I know everything and my products or project are the best projects, then your learning stops. If your learning stops, you cannot become better. Your chances of failure increase drastically. Uh, there was there was a project. We were doing an amazing uh, project in uh, for a company in biometric identification. Okay. And that project, the client kept on saying, Oh, very good, very good. And somehow the other parameters of the project were not showing me and be amazingly good results. So I had warned my project manager that be careful this project, there is a potential of this project closing. And my pro project manager was a person and normal. Okay, The feedback on the client is, is perfect. I said, don't go by the feedback, look at your internal processes, look at your internal deliverables. Uh, they, see, many a times people are not too keen on giving you a negative feedback. Yeah. Okay, You have to also consider that many a times Sometimes people I, hesitate. Yeah. So why should I, why should I give you negative feedback? Hmm. So 
it is your duty it is not your client's duty to tell you that you are doing wrong it is your duty to find out that you are doing wrong and correct it so i had told him i had warned him that see don't don't go by that check there are a lot of things that we are not doing correct and as usual he said no no you you are looking you are seeing too much on things that don't exist hmm. and ultimately the project did go down uh, and and on detailed analysis uh, we found that there were a lot of things that we had done wrong we could have done better we could have done a lot of things better but that was one <coughs> one one project where i thought that <clears throat> if we had been proactive in correcting our processes correcting our deliverables we could have done uh, much 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 better this was one project that i really it really affected me because i thought that we could have prevented this but but things did not work in our favor okay sir if a project fails like do they uh, when the project starts do they make the payment in advance or something like that or well, it depends hmm. okay for an it services company like tasha we are a small yeah. company yeah so for us it's a it's a double edged sword hmm. payments are a double edged sword okay so you have to be very pragmatic about when you cut the corners mm -hmm. not sorry not cut the corners when you really put the pressure for payment yeah and recently in a very big international project we lost a large amount of money because we were not too proactive in collecting money large large amount so there are a, there are a lot of people that do wrong things also so yeah so yeah we take the service yeah, and yeah, they... yeah we will pay tomorrow no no the bank has a problem no 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 my payment is not going through these things do come in yeah. and you will have to understand in even with this experience the experience that i had i could not be proactive enough to collect that money we had to pay a huge price of uh, losing a substantial amount of money substantial because there's a lot of things involved when you Uh, develop a product right yeah so, so my next question was related to that like how do you ensure the quality and reliability of your products quality and reliability you cannot you cannot uh, 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 promise 100% quality 100% reliability that is not possible because the testing effort to to uh, deliver 100% quality and reliable product is so large that you will never be able to justify a so it is always a trade off between cost and quality always if you cannot maintain that then there is a problem so you will have to talk with your client hmm. to ensure that he is on the same page as you are hmm. right if your client is paying you 10000 then he will get quality he should get quality equivalent to 10000 Yeah. you cannot give him more otherwise you will suffer from your pro profitability loss mm -hmm. okay now there is a second part to it quality ke andar there is second part to it and that is centered around security mm. and that is a much more sensitive area than than simple overall quality if you are talking about certain standards so you are developing a credit card say processing solution mm. will you ever be able to deliver a credit card processing solution without a pci certification or a pci check you will never be able to do it because then the government will kill you right yeah. so you will that is these are all the factors of understanding and deciding on what is the base minimum security or quality that you want you will have to start the uh, standards and say okay at x price i am only going to deliver this after this if you want this you will have to pay me different money okay so to know more about this industry can you explain like how this uh, software as a service industry works for a layman software as a service is hmm. depends it's a it's a big 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 uh, word okay yeah. and it depends on how you define it mm -hmm. now in a layman term software as a service is something like you using the software mm -hmm. till the time you want to use it 
and paying only for your utilization. Okay. Like, let me take an example of Zoho. The common, the most common example is Zoho. Mm -hmm. Now, Zoho is a huge, it has a list of services. So, agar aapko say accounting software chahiye. So, accounting software, you will go and subscribe to Zoho. You will use Zoho and say either you become too big or you become small and uh, there will be a day when Zoho is not good for you. You will say, okay, I'm not, now I will stop using Zoho and I will move to some somebody else, something else. So, Zoho, so software is a, as a service is something like, like your Uber. You don't own the car. Hmm. You own the ride. That's it. The You're in, in software. Software as a service, you own the, the utilization of the software hmm. till the time you want to use it. But, and then you pay for that utilization. You don't, you don't in Uber, you don't take that car home. He drops you and that person goes away and everything goes. So that's how it is. Software as a service. So like you just said, if you uh, you take a Uber and you then went to your destination. So what if like the software is going, uh, working for me and how long does it like, what is the duration? Like what? Up to you, up to you. Hmm. You say, Merago, ek saal use karna hai, you pay for one, one year. Okay. You say, I want to use it forever, 10 years, you pay for 10 years. Okay. There, there are clauses that you sign about your security of data. You clauses mm -hmm. you sign about how what will happen after 10 years. Because the data is yours. Data belongs to you. The software is of Zoho or mm -hmm. whosoever you have utilized the service. So you will then there will be a clause that says, okay, how do you export the data or how do you get the data? What happens after 10 years? So that is the only thing you have to be careful about. Okay, so sir, uh, are you planning to launch any new technological advancements in like Tasha Infotech? Tasha Infotech, we usually go by what our clients want. <clears throat> okay. So if our client wants something, we give them that. We have right now moved on from the old technology that we were supporting that is Angular Angular or Angular JS or Angular MVC and Java combination. We have moved to uh, React Native, React JS, uh, and Node.js. Hmm. And for mobile development, we have moved from uh, the native development. We were very good at native development, Android native development, we were very good at. We have moved to Flutter. So we keep on changing based on the needs of the client. Okay. So, but it is the decisions are more driven by uh, the client wanting us as well as the trends in the industry. Yeah. We will not go and do, say, unless a client wants, we will not go um, to a technology that is not that easily sellable. Okay. So my question was related to that next question. What trends do you see shaping the future of development? Uh, rad application tools, rapid, rapid application tools are mm -hmm. going to be going to become very popular. Uh, mm -hmm. Things where you can develop, develop things faster. So mm -hmm. we have seen those trends happening. We have been hearing about low code, no code for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. But there has been no standardization or no powerful tool that has taken over this industry in that segment. I am still waiting to see something good happening in the low code, no code, low code, no code market. That is where I, I my interest would be. Mm -hmm. Because at one point of time in past, we had some very, very powerful tools in that domain, which have disappeared and have not come back to support the new industry, new uh, technology trend. So these are the few things I'm waiting for. Hmm. The thing that I am really excited about is artificial intelligence. Ah, for sure. What does Metis Intelligence Systems do? What is like the core model? Metis Intelligence Systems is a, we are a fintech. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. We are a fintech. We, our aim was always to create Metis Intelligence Systems as a, as a platform where we would create products for fintechs using AI and ML. That is that is what our aim has been. That is what our mission statement is. Hmm. So we, uh, like see our first product hmm. is a product which helps you understand your clients better. Okay. Hmm. 
like there is a fintech the fintech is say for example into the area of lending when you go to take take a loan people ask you for various documents mm-hmm. right now uh, there are there are no systems that can give you a comprehensive look of your customer mm-hmm. so if rakhi tomorrow wants a loan rakhi goes to say a bank and says i want a loan so mm-hmm. the bank says is okay give me your bank statement if you are an msme give your gst data give me your mca data give me your bureau report all of that yeah so what we do is we take all these reports we using artificial intelligence and machine learning mm-hmm. we process all this data together to create intelligence to say from all these reports we believe that mm-hmm. rakhi is has a good credit profile something of that sort okay so so uh, how do you manage risk in rapidly changing financial landscapes ah uh, how do i answer this i i need a session of 2 hours to answer this <laughs> this particular you cut short it <laughs> yeah handling risk in fintechs is going to be of paramount importance yeah okay the government all the all all everybody involved is terrifically behind the fintechs to ensure that they comply with all regulations hmm. okay so you cannot shortcut any regulation cannot shortcut any regulation you cannot sweep anything under the carpet you, any fintech who tries to do that does it at his or her own risk you have seen what happened to paytm yeah That's paytm i was going paytm. to mention that yeah yeah and literally maybe the government did it to set an example i'm i'm being very honest with you the government yeah. the government did it to set set an example the government wanted to say if we can do it with paytm we can do it with anybody okay so a paytm at one point of time was the blue eyed boy of the uh, the fintech world he was literally like a legend if you see uh, the owner vijay sharma he was yeah. literally like in conferences and all that he was mobbed he was literally yeah. his autographs were taken all of that Yeah. but the government said boss compliance you have to all do compliance so no shortcuts but to answer in brief there are two words that every security professional or every every risk management professional should understand okay and write it down as a mantra as a guru mantra mm-hmm. and that is due care and due diligence if you can show to the audit authority that you took due due care hmm. and you after due care you were diligent in implementing those processes the government will give you time to fix your particular problem hmm. if you are going to be careless hmm. if you feel that you are too smart and hmm. nobody will harm you then you are living in a fool's paradise and you will be harmed so two words due care due diligence everyone must concentrate on those two words so so what have been some of the most you know successful marketing strategies you have deployed in like meeting? marketing strategy mein hmm. the the marketing strategy books that were published in 1992 still hold true whether you do it via using digital world manual world all that quality sells innovation sells problem solving sells hmm. okay you cannot technology cannot drive a product hmm. a product has to drive technology you have hmm. to solve a problem to be successful you have to solve a problem to be successful you cannot say oh i have a great product hmm. and become successful yeah you have to say oh there is a great problem that i am solving then you become successful so for marketing uh, for really starry eyed boys and girls who say oh i am great in technology so what there are out of the 7 billion population that is there in the world 3.5 billion people are good in technology good in technology yeah yeah the youth so basically <laughs> basically you have to find a problem hmm. that you want to solve and you are solving once you get a hang of that then comes the second phase of how i use technology or how i use a process to solve the problem okay very important if you if you look at whatsapp what is whatsapp 
if you tell any any graduate any graduate of any good college of india whatsapp can be developed very easily hmm. but how did they solve it what did they do different they got a great hang of what people wanted hmm. and today you don't say i am messaging send me documents on whatsapp hmm. whatsapp your data hmm. right we say that why because that has become a standard and how did they become a standard not by saying oh i i can i can i have a great technology they said i will allow you to talk or interact with each other easily hmm. and that is what sells nothing else sells sir one more question which i would like to ask is like what is metis doing different than its competitors like in your field we are looking at data in a very different way hmm. right Yeah. Now, if I were to tell you mm-hmm. that today GST data, GST ka ab if you look at GST, there are list of invoices. Mm-hmm. Can I take a lending decision based on the list of invoices? I don't think so. Why? Because I can't trust that like that one. No, no, it is a government uh, database. Yeah. GST data is a government government repository of data. Yeah. government repository of data and still we we cannot take decisions i will justify that by saying that invoices are not a parameter for decision making okay. why because i can create invoices as many as i want yeah. but unless i don't understand i have the invoices been paid or not mm-hmm. invoices is a wrong ma- matrix to take decision mm-hmm. so i have to find out what are my list of invoices and where the invoices have been paid or not hmm. now the list of invoices are there in the gst database but its payment is not there hmm. has the invoices been paid or not no that data is not there now where is that data that data is present in the bank statement so unless i don't process both these data sources together hmm. i will never be able to help any organization take data take decisions that is what we do differently So, so how so we did... cost uh, verify? We triangulate hmm. data from multiple sources. Hmm. So, so how do you see the relationship between fintech companies and traditional banks evolving? They have to. Every 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 person uh, who is into banking or needs money has to take the help of technology to take decisions. Hmm. Aaj. आज आप अपने वी आर सिटिंग डू यू थिंक एस बी आई विल एवर बी एबल टू ग्रो और टेक डिसीजन इजिली इफ दे डू नॉट टेक हेल्प ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी इट इज वर्चुअली इम्पॉसिबल नॉट पॉसिबल एंड नाउ विद द वर्ल्ड द वे द वर्ल्ड इज मूविंग इन द कंजम्पन ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी यू विल बी लेफ्ट बिहाइंड यूर कॉम्पिटिटर विल ओवर टेक यू इफ यू डू नॉट use technology in the right manner your competition will do that period so what do you want to say on that thing that like some people still prefer like the traditional banking system like going to the bank and then filling a form and then taking out the money what is like your take on that still people can be grudge like... people i cannot grudge people for their <laughs> habits okay i cannot grudge people for that yeah. and there are still that that layer of people mm-hmm. who still do not trust technology still yeah. would prefer but they are forgetting one thing that the second layer mm-hmm. is always technology yeah their bank accounts are not meant maintained in pen and paper in old time ledgers no yeah. longer yeah. everyone Everything your is data in... is always already a, 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 in an electronic a... format yeah so the only satisfaction they get yeah. is they see those clerks huh. they see the, those people okay count the person over there <laughs> yeah so and all good all good every everyone has a has a reason for it and we cannot we cannot grudge them there will be a time when like in uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, this new trend that has started online traditional banks have started coming yeah. in at least globally that idea uh, idea has becomes uh, quite popular where there are no branches nothing happening there are only atms and there is uh, online uh, mm-hmm. screen so slowly and steadily that idea will come up but in india it will still take time because there is a huge amount of illiterate 
people hmm. who need to first be brought into the banking sector hmm. before we think of removing the branches and the banks hmm. so in india it will still take quite a while uh, if somebody tells me in the next 5 years no not it's not happening hmm. in the next 10 years probably in the next 20 years maybe maybe so you do think that like banks can't completely vanish from the you know yeah. the system of payments and no. no 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 it it cannot it cannot happen because hmm. in india we are talking about a different aaj tum india ki kya baat karte ho talk about africa hmm. the whole african uh, whole continent is so very 